Hi, uh, Peter McCready here from the Blue Carbon Lab. My colleagues and I have just published a paper in Science of the Total Environment titled uh, Offshore Decommissioning Horizon Scan, Research Priorities to Support Decision-Making Activities for Oil and Gas Infrastructure. Now I appreciate it's generally scientists that read scientific papers, uh, but there's some really important stuff in here uh, that I think should be accessible to those outside of academia. So I'm going to try and break it down for you in this video. But let's set the scene first. So humans have dramatically modified the earth and we are faced with some hefty waste challenges. Plastics, nuclear waste, greenhouse gases. Even in space, we've got junk flying around that's called space junk. And I'm, I'm here to talk about oil and gas structures in our oceans. So we've got thousands of oil and gas structures in our oceans and they're reaching the end of their production life. And they are due for decommissioning. In the Gulf of Mexico, there are more than 4,000 giant steel jackets, 37,000 kilometers of pipeline, which is enough to do a circumference of the earth. It's the largest artificial reef complex in the world. Here in Australia, where I'm from, there's only three and a half thousand kilometers of pipeline, 57 platforms and 11 floating facilities. But the cost of decommissioning these structures is a whopping $50 billion. Current legislation requires these structures to be fully removed leave the seafloor as you found it. Makes good sense, seems fair. In some cases, however, alternative decommissioning options such as reefing may be considered or allowed when uh, potential impacts on the environment, society, technical feasibility, economy, and future asset liability are considered. As you'll see from some of the videos I've been showing, which are um, snippets of footage from uh, ROV pilots, remotely operated vehicle pilots during their routine integrity inspections. You can see that these structures support some very impressive marine life. And in some cases, there are concerns that removal of these structures could have net negative impacts on the marine life that they support. Indeed, some of the highest densities of fish in the world have been recorded on oil and gas structures, higher than coral reefs and seagrass meadows. And there have also been some rare and threatened species known to reside on these structures since they have been acting like de facto marine protected areas because they are inaccessible to trawl fishing. So clearly this decision, should they stay or should they go, is going to be complicated. We recently surveyed average people on the street about their awareness of the issue and it was clear that most, almost all, had no idea. Even much of the marine science community have little awareness. So it's good to be prepared for this very complex conversation ahead and this is going to be a very complicated issue. I would hope that decisions that are made are well informed by independent and high quality science. Surely we all, we all want this. So I'm going to explain the methodology of our study and our findings but before I go any further, I want to shout out to our sponsors, in particular, the Australian Government's National Environmental Science Program through their Marine and Coastal Hub. And the second, to the co-authors and amazing collaborators on this study, the Brains Trust, in particular, Deakin University's Blue Carbon Lab PhD student, Sarah Watson, and close colleague and uh, amazing scientist, Dr. Di McLean, a fish ecologist from the Australian Institute of Marine Science. So here's what we did. We rallied the world's foremost authorities on the topic to offer their expert opinion on what are the key questions that we should be asking to inform decommissioning decisions. Now the experts were surveyed, they weren't just our academic buddies, they were also experts from industry and from government and we ended up with an interdisciplinary cohort of 35 global experts from science, policy, and practice. And these experts were selected from global decommissioning hotspots around the world to ensure we had geographic representation. The US, the UK, Australia, Middle East, Southeast Asia, and so on. And in addition, we selected experts from a range of disciplines, um, environment, social engineering, policy, governments, economy, economic uh, backgrounds, and so on. An important exercise 
for us really was to break down silos and also um, ensure that we could take a transdisciplinary approach to this very complex problem. So with these great minds, we got them together to rumble and ultimately reach a consensus. What are the key issues going forward in relation to informing decommissioning decisions and how might we address those questions? So drum roll please. According to the experts, the highest uh, research priorities are, number one, to assess the impacts of contamination and their acceptable environmental limits to reduce potential ecological harm. Number two, to define risk and acceptability thresholds in policy and governance. Number three, to characterize liability issues for ongoing costs and responsibility of these structures if we're gonna leave them in the ocean. Number four, to quantify the impacts of different decommissioning scenarios on ecosystem services they provide. So it basically means the contribution uh, to planet and people. And an example might be a structure could be enhancing fish production, which contributes to commercial and recreational fisheries. Then we had number five, quantifying ecological connectivity, which basically means how do these structures affect the movement of marine organisms and how might this be impacted under different decommissioning scenarios. Number six, assessing marine life productivity. So are these structures contributing to breeding of fish and invertebrates? Number seven, determining feasibility of reusing or repurposing these structures, fishing clubs, offshore, seaweed aquaculture, wind farms, etc. All ideas were on the table. Number eight, identification of stakeholder views and perceptions and values for different decommissioning options. Number nine, quantification of greenhouse gas emissions for different decommissioning scenarios. And number 10, developing a transdisciplinary decommissioning decision making process. Now, it's great to come up with big questions, but what's also important is to figure out how these questions might actually be addressed with a healthy research budget. So we then used our experts to develop a roadmap for future research. And I won't go through the research roadmap for addressing these questions, but uh, if you're interested, I encourage you to check out the paper and you can learn more about it. Now, if you've made it to this far in the video, thanks for listening. I hope you found it useful and helpful. Cheers.